Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 329 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Howie Lambert. She's worked as a staff writer and story editor on The Expanse, which is currently my favorite show on TV. And she also co-wrote a graphic novel called The Expanse Origins, which explores the backstories of some of the show's major characters. And now, here's her interview with Hallie Lambert. All right, so we're here with Hallie Lambert. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> okay, so it says in your bio that you came to Los Angeles when you were 17 to pursue acting, writing, and producing. So just tell us a bit about what that was like and what your goals were at that time. Um, I had transferred out of um, University of Washington. I was there for a very short time um, studying journalism. And initially, I basically just wanted to get to the sun in Southern California. Um, and I had heard that they had some good um, you know, journalism programs uh, at Chapman. And so I ended up transferring there. Um, into the journalism program, uh, broadcast journalism, and I had to take a screenwriting class. And uh, when I was in the class, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is it. I want to do screenwriting because growing up, I grew up in a small town outside of Seattle and the idea of writing for television or movies uh, never even occurred to me that that was like a job, a real, <laughs> a real <laughs> job. Um, and I didn't actually grow up watching much TV or film. Um, it was, you know, the go outside and play uh, sort of time um, on the farm. Um, so it was like a whole new door had opened a uh, window into this other world. And I, you know, shortly after that changed my, uh, my uh, emphasis and to the screenwriting uh, film program. It and Okay, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and did you find that helpful? I mean, did you learn a lot there that you used in your subsequent film and TV career? I did. I mean, I learned a lot coming, you know, from a place with not really any background in film and television at all, except for just, you know, writing as its own thing. Um, it, I learned a ton and it's a really great school. I know they've grown by leaps and bounds since I was even there. There's uh, Chapman now has its own little mini studio and everything. And, um, it, it did really drive my want to be in film and television. At the time, it was still like everything was about film, film, film. Um, but right out of college, I, I first had an internship at the Donner's company. Um, and then quickly got into, uh, behind the scenes at CSI was my first writing room. I was the writer's PA, PA, PA on there very shortly for a little bit and um, moved up to be the executive assistant there. And um, so since then, I was just always in television. And I realized that TV is where I wanted to be. It's a little more instant gratification, so to speak. You're like not years and years of trying to get a film made. You get to see your work uh, much quicker. Um, and nowadays, I'm like really glad I fell into the TV side not only because I like it, but everything seems to be going in that direction. And, and uh, there's so much content now. And to, I was just looking at your IMDb page and it looks like you were doing acting for a while. I did. I did try my stint in acting for a little bit um, when I was figuring out, uh, you know, the existential crisis of <laughs> your early 20s or mid 20s. Um, and as much as I enjoyed doing stage, I realized it just being on camera was not my thing. <laughs> I just, I would freeze up. I would do my best. But by the time, like once they hit record, it'd be like, uh, what am I saying? What am I doing? <laughs> so, you know, and it's such a, that's such a hard, hard business. Um, that you have to, you know, well, I guess any of it, you have to really, really want it and be able to promote yourself and, you know, get out there. And that was just not for me. So I would be back behind the uh, camera. <laughs> I'm happy here. <laughs> I mean, it looks like you had some some small gigs on shows that our fans would be interested in, like Buffy and the X Files. Yes. Yeah, so if you blink, you'll miss me on Buffy. But I was in the Hush episode, which I know is a very, very like well known episode, and it was very cool to be to be there. I'm like one of the crying students in the in the um, uh, cafeteria, um, and it's so funny because recently. The gang at uh, the Expanse was like looking up all my <laughs> the little videos and like, oh, there she is. Oh, you know, so it's pretty funny. Um, but it was a it was a fun, a uh, different experience, you know, to see the other side of things. And I think um, it's it's great for writers to have that experience. 
It's were you a fan? Were you a fan of those shows of Buffy and the X Files? I loved the X Files. I I only watched a very small amount of Buffy, and I love the concept, and I really enjoyed the show. But it was on at a time when I, like I said, growing up, there were very limited amount of shows that I actually watched because I had very limited amount of time, like that my parents would let me watch TV. So I, my Quantum Leap and like X Files um, were like my sci fi shows. Oh, and um, and. Uh, um, Sequest <laughs> with the short lived Sequest was something I loved. Um, but yeah, I missed out on a lot of, you know, the start growing up with Star Trek and Buffy. I missed out on a lot of those shows just because, uh, um, yeah, I wasn't in front of the TV much. Were you able to read science fiction books at all? Um, some of the early, like some, but not a whole lot. I actually didn't grow up on a lot of sci fi, which is ironic because now look where I'm at. <laughs> um, but I've really grown to love it over the years uh, quite a bit. And especially this this hard um, sci-fi, with the real science and everything has been a really great experience and opened my eyes again to a lot of new new worlds. Yeah. It also says in your bio that you got a master's in psychology. Like, where did that fit in? <laughs> that So we'll go back to my, I was talking about the 20s existential crisis sort of situation. So um I was working, um, I gotten, uh, started working again with Noreen Shankar, who I met on CSI and been working off and on with over these many years. And, um, I was trying to decide, like, do I really want to write? Because that's all I'd ever known my entire life is I'd want to be a writer. But then of course you hit like, well, if I'm not a writer, if I fail, who am I? What do I do? And, so sort of like a self-sabotaging thing. She's like, well, I like psychology and people and want to help people. You know, I think it's also on par with writing psychology. Um, and I was like, I'm going to go back and get my master's degree and I'll go be a psychologist. And if, you know, I can write some stuff, you know, on my own while I'm doing that. Um, but, but kind of getting out of the entertainment industry. And so while I was still working, um, I think we are on Grimm at the time. Um, on, in television, uh, at night I was going to school and through that whole process and like self-discovery of just getting my master's in psychology, I re like rekindled that passion for writing and confidence probably also, and knowing that that's what I wanted. So after I graduated with masters, I set aside my goals of going to get my doctorate and said, I, I know now that I, I want to write, I want to be in television. This is what I want to do. And so it was kind of this recommitment to it. And it was shortly after that, actually, that uh, we started working on The Expanse. So has that, the degree in psychology, has that been useful uh, in, in writing characters? Oh, it's extremely useful. I mean, just in everyday life, but also in writing and, and yeah, creating characters and delving into their psyche and knowing what, you know, their motivations might be and how they interact and what I think a more real world, real um, human experience, you know, not only just on your daily life, but also with different disorders and depression and coping mechanisms that people use, um, that can be really hard and dark, uh, aspects of our psyche. I mean, what would you say is sort of an example of human psychology that you know now, having gotten the degree that you weren't aware of before you got the degree? Oh, a lot of the abnormal psychology uh, stuff, which was fascinating. I mean, I, we in my research when I worked on CSI, because I did a lot of the research for the episodes on that, you see a lot of really dark, like, <laughs> we get real case files. And it's actually one of the reasons why I ended up leaving it, just because I couldn't, you know, process all the horrible stuff that people, humans do to each other. Um, and so I think it helped me process all that stuff quite a bit and kind of learn, you know, why or why some people maybe are the way they are. Um, and, uh, the, the victims that, uh, how they would cope, uh, and interact with the world and it would change your view of the world and change your glasses of how you see everything. So, and interact with others, um, yeah. Well, well, so you mentioned that you met Naren Shankar, who's one of the showrunners of The Expanse. You met him on CSI originally. Could you talk about how you met him and kind of what 
what that was like working with him? Yeah. So I came in as the writer's PA and he started the same season I did, uh, uh, beginning of season three. And we just clicked and got along really well. And, uh, I shortly after that moved up to be his assistant and then our other EP on the expanses or, uh, CSI's, um, producer. Uh, and since then we just, have he and his wife have become like family at the same time. You know, we just work really well together and he's a great human being. And I think that's, that's evident in the way every show I've worked on. It's, it's like a family. And, you know, I think that trickles down from the top. If you have a great leader and an open one and one that's has a really good heart as well, it permeates through the entire show and the entire production. Um, yeah. So it's, 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 we haven't been working cons like consistently the entire what, 16 years now, I guess. Um, but even when we haven't been working on a project together, um, why we still stay in touch and, and obviously so, and now we're back on the expanse and actually I was reading scripts for him as he was looking for the next project he wanted to go on. And he wasn't super interested in reading stuff from the sci-fi network just because He'd worked with them before and it, just the current stuff they were doing at the time was just, he wasn't super interested in it, but I read the pilot for the expanse and I still remember exactly where I was when I shut the last page of the script. And I was like, that's really interesting. I really like, Noreen has to read this because if he likes it and can get on as like, you know, the showrunner, that means I could probably go on with <laughs> him and I would love to work on this and see this come to fruition. And yeah. Five years later, four years later, here we are. So. <laughs> so, so what you said, you remember exactly where you were, like, where were you when you read it? I, I was in my bed. It was like, I was going to sleep and it was right before bed. I was reading it. And I actually think called him in the middle of like, at like <laughs> 10 something. I was like, I really, you really should read the script. You should really read it. Um, yeah. So it was a, yeah, I'm so glad it worked out. <laughs> I mean, another question I had was that, you know, you mentioned that you didn't have a huge background in science fiction and that this is a really hard, serious, hard science fiction show where I, I heard even that the uh, the script pages are color coded depending on what type of gravity there is in the scene. And uh -huh. were you ever sort of like uh, intimidated or like overwhelmed by that level of like science fiction hardness coming onto the show? Extremely intimidated, but... We have a very inclusive, like, group of very smart people who don't talk or express, like, don't look down on somebody. Like, they're really, like, um, Ty and Daniel, who are the writers of the, of the books, are in the room with us and um, would explain all the research. And we'd have charts of the way, you know gravity and thrust gravity and all that works. And so there was like a really crash course and all this stuff and, but really accessible, like easier to understand. And even the stuff that was like harder to understand, we get up and draw a little, you know, stuff on the whiteboard. Um, and through the show also, uh, I've since, you know, met NASA scientists, JPL, real astronauts. And so it's just been a continuous, continuous learning, um, experience which has even grown my interest in it even more and it's it's been a very yes arm arms open that's the only way i can i think put it right now um experience of getting everybody up to speed um and everyone's really into it down to the actors and wanting to make sure they do everything correctly to science as as best we possibly can so um it's I'm, I mean, growing up, I never really thought of myself as somebody who was like a very science minded person. And that was also an indication of the time I grew up in where, uh, you know, I was a girl, so I couldn't play the saxophone. I literally had my band teacher say that to me. So it's like that's that time when STEM still was really for women, for girls was dumbed down or wasn't really available or didn't know it was. Um, and so it's, it's kind of been like a, second chance, I guess, in a way to, uh, to get involved in that side of things. Yeah. Well, so again, looking at the, your IMDb page, uh, in the first season or two or three, you um, are credited initially as executive assistant and then 
uh, later a staff writer. Could you just explain the difference between those and sort of what that process was? So the first season I came on as, um, yeah, the executive assistant and also uh, as the writer's assistant. So for the executive assistant, that's uh, basically running the executive producer's lives <laughs> and making sure they're where they have to be and organizing a lot of um, uh, between production and the writer's room. And it's, it's a catch all of a lot of different, different jobs. And then on top of that, the writer's assistant job, which they're usually two separate jobs on most shows. Um, you have at least one, if not two uh, executive assistants, and then you have at least one separate, or two writers assistants and the writers assistant is there taking notes uh, throughout the, the story breaking and collating the notes and just being part of the whole process of, of writing. Uh, and then from there, so that season when I was writer assistant, I was given my first the second season. I was given my first script actually to write, which was sort of a freelance, um, Ty and Daniel said, we're going to give you our script and there you go. And, uh, since then, in the following season, I came on a staff writer and this season is story editor. So it's just, you keep moving up and that's just the, the way the rooms typically work as far as titles go. So, so what actually was that? The first script you wrote, what episode was that? Uh, it was 209, The Weeping Somnambulist. And so had you written other, like how much writing had you done prior to that? Uh, nothing that had been official, like on a, officially on a show. So I've done a lot of writing behind the scenes of my own stuff, um, and participating in, in the writing process and I'll write a scene here or there that will make it into a script, but it's not my script. So, you know, you're not, it's a very collaborative job, um, for on a lot of shows. Uh, so yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't had any, uh, of my own credits yet. You know, it's that, that hump to get over that door to break through, um, which can be a bit difficult. And I was just very lucky to finally make it through that door. <laughs> so could you say more about that process of, of writing the first script? Did you kind of um, get it right, right away? Or did you, um, did you have to rewrite it a couple times or? There's always the rewriting uh, process and notes process. It goes through a number of, of, um, steps. So we, we typically write the outline for the episode together as a room for the most part. And then the writer or, you know, you'll go off and write and the actual episode, which is, I, I kind of say like putting the flesh, uh, on the bones that we've created as a room. Uh, and then typically there'll be one or two passes of notes from the showrunner and from the room, everybody can kind of chime in and give notes, uh, on the story and then we'll be able to, then I'll be able to go and make those changes and create things different, you know, with whatever the notes were. Uh, and then, uh, the showrunner, uh, usually will take up just a polish pass over it just to make sure it's all tonally consistent with the rest. Uh, and that's, you know, and then we'll go through studio notes pass and then network notes pass. So it's a, it's a lot of different, uh, drafts. <laughs> Yeah. So how, how many scripts have you written um, now? I've written two so far, and I'm about to write my third um, coming up for the season four. Would you say that there's a, like a particular character or setting or anything that you um, are particularly focused on? I love Avasarala. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's just really fun to write and kind of her strength, but also snarkiness. <laughs> Um, and I really did enjoy Prax's character. He's, you know, that kind of soft-spoken, you know, nerd botanist, uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I mean, they're all, they all have their different tones and, and fun emotional arcs to, to dig into. Amos is another fun one. I think those are all also, uh, fan favorites. <laughs> I mean, so so you said you like Officer Allah's snarkiness. Are you a snarky person? I don't think so. I think maybe that's why it's so fun to write because I'm super chill and not snarky. Um, 
So maybe it is, maybe I am in my head, but it never comes out of my mouth. I don't know. But I think that's why I find it so fun is because she is so much the opposite of myself. Um, so it's just like a new voice of maybe my, you know, alter ego, maybe. Well, in, in the books, she's, she swears a lot. And I gather there was like, um, that was sort of had to be censored a little bit in the first season and maybe in the second season that loosened up. Yeah, it loosened up a little bit in the second season because um, our time slot changed and some of the regulations as far as when uh, sci-fi's regulations came down. Um, but then again, in season three, we were back to the way, pretty much the way it was in season one. Um, and now that we're on Amazon, we're, you know, we might be able to have her voice a little bit more like the books. So maybe a little bit more cursing, not just for <laughs> profanity's sake, you know, we're not just doing it, but that is in the books, that is her character. And uh, one of the fun things about her character, because it seems so, so to have an, a beautiful, regal, you know, older woman cursing is just the it's just a very interesting combination. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So let's talk about that process of transitioning from sci-fi to Amazon. So mm -hmm. do you remember where you were when you found out that sci-fi would not be picking up season four? Uh, yes, I was in Waikiki having a Mai Tai and uh, Narain called me. And my friend who I was visiting was off at work, so I was by myself and I, of course, started crying right there. I was trying so hard not to, you know, sitting on this beautiful beach. Uh, but it, I mean, it, yeah, it was so emotional. I just started crying. I'm so, so glad I had my glasses on, my <laughs> sunglasses. And then when I went to go pick up my friend from work, he came out and I was driving. I was like, I can't drive. He's like, what's wrong? And I just told him and I just started burst out into tears, um, even more so there. <laughs> Oh, well, so, so did it, yeah. So you were on vacation and it kind of did that kind of like, I don't know, how'd that affect your vacation or it did because I, I went for my birthday and, you know, we were stressed out. I was in stressing about whether we're going to be picked up at all or not and trying to like set aside. Cause it's like, I know there's nothing I can do at this point. So I'm just not going to try not to think about it and try and enjoy my vacation and, you know, do some of my own writing. So I did my best to not let, it, you know, this, the anticipation of whether we were going to get picked up or canceled um, ruin it. But it really, it did take an emotional toll. Um, I think the whole month and a half prior to getting the cancellation was very anxiety producing because none of us really knew what was going to happen. Yeah. I mean... See, see, from my perspective, it came as a big surprise because the show was like 100 percent on Rotten Tomatoes and really popular, it seemed. So I, I was sort of really stunned when that happened. Yeah, logically, <laughs> but being behind the scenes and kind of knowing how the deals worked out and knowing that, um, you know, it wasn't a big profit for sci fi, just the way the deal was made with Alcon. Um, so knowing that side of things it's understandable why the things just didn't work out with sci-fi. But at the same time, what you're saying, it's 100% on Rotten Tomatoes and we have this amazing fan base and it's picking up. So trying to, you know, square those two sides was really difficult. And that's what made it like, well, I have no idea what's going to happen. And also from my perspective, it seems like the fan campaign to save the show kicked up right away. Like, mm -hmm. Did you feel if you were in... Waikiki, did you feel like disconnected from that or like I got to get back so I can take part in that? Well, I was actually the day I got the news was the day I got back on the plane. I was planning to come home anyhow. Oh, okay. um, so I, I got back to L.A. that night and um, yeah, it really it suddenly sparked this hope again. Like maybe it wasn't completely dead, knowing that Alcon could shop it elsewhere and the how quick you know, the fans did just start the uprising, so to speak, and uh, got organized so quickly. And it was overwhelming and humbling and just gave me hope. Uh, it's just it, completely incredible to be a part of. Um, 
Well, because, I mean, you were sort of hands-on with this, right? Because don't you run the Expanse Writer's Room Twitter? Yeah, I do. Um, but, you know, like, I was involved and I tweet, I want you know, retweeted fans and I, and I, you know, did my thank yous. And then when they put the banner up flying over Amazon, I drove over there. I don't live very far and drove over there and, you know, I'm an emotional person. It was another, like, I started crying. I was like, Oh my gosh, these people, so many people, huge fans, uh, just love this show so much and was, were retweeting the writer's room tweets. And, um, you know, there was even the point where, uh, some fans would do their own declarations on video and post what the expanse meant to them and how it changed their lives, which was incredibly touching. And just to be able to see that outpouring, because, you know, a lot of times when we're behind the scenes, we see that we have fans, but to the extent that they really emotionally touch, uh, touch the fans, you know, we don't get to see that up close and personal very much. So this was, was a very overwhelming experience to be a part of. I mean, just for people who might not know, could you just explain a bit more about when you say the banner over Amazon, what that was? So I think within like an, it was like within a couple hours, they raised enough money. The fans um, got together, raised enough money to fly a Save the Expanse banner over their Amazon uh, studios in Santa Monica. And with like a uh, plane, a little plane. With a plane, plane. yes. Yeah, a little plane. Um, At two different times during the day. So they did like an hour at around noon and then they did another hour like so around lunchtime and then around when everyone was um was wrapping up for work and it's so funny because i actually have a friend who works in the same building not at amazon but at another production company there <laughs> and like a week after that where we were talking he's like yeah we heard i heard the plane going by <laughs> i heard the plane it was going by <laughs> um yeah and so not long after that they raised money to uh send one of the little Rosinante models up into space or orbit uh, for a short bit. And that was really cool because they videotaped it and then um, edited together a cool little video showing its ascent and descent, which was very cool. Well, right. As a, as a science fiction fan, it's just always so frustrating when they cancel these shows that are super popular among science fiction fans. I mean, like Firefly was, yeah. you know, the the big one for me when I was younger, and then Farscape. And I was always, you know, I, there was nothing really I could do at that time. I mean, this was even really before social media, I think. And, you know, but but now I'm like, okay, I have a science fiction podcast with, you know, 18,000 listeners. Like, it's time to, like, get in here and do something about this. You know, now I can maybe move the needle a little bit. And so... I was going crazy. I mean, I was, I think I tweeted more about the expanse than I tweeted about everything else <laughs> ever. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. It's it, now it, it's an incredible time for, for fans in that capacity. I, I mean, you have a voice, whereas before it probably felt like you didn't like I'm, Firefly could have had a couple more seasons. If, you know, perhaps if we had had the social media, like we do now, we're able to organize the way our fans were able to organize uh, together rather than being dispersed in all their little things that um, aren't able to be heard as loudly when, you know, there you have 20 different groups doing different things, all wanting the same goal. It's not going to be heard as much as those groups coming together um, and organizing. So it's very cool. There's a, it's happening more and more and the show is being saved by the fans, which, yeah. Yeah, and the way I remember it with Farscape is like you, by the time you hear that the show's canceled, they've already broken down the sets and the actors have all gone on to different shows and things. And you know, yeah, yeah. you just feel totally powerless. Yeah. Um. But so, uh, all right. So, but on a more cheerful note, so the the show did get picked up again. So, do you remember now where you were when you heard that uh, Amazon was going to come in and pick up the show? I was. At the table with the actors and Lorraine at the science or space convention, um, sitting at the table next to where Jeff Bezos was before he went up and announced it. And uh, that experience was quite surreal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Could you just like paint us a picture of what that was like? We, yeah, we got there for a panel. Uh, science panel, which went really well. And, you know, we'd heard Jeff Bezos was going to be there and that they, Alcon was in talks with Amazon, but the deal hadn't closed yet. They weren't sure what was, you know, if it would even. Um, and we were, 
the group was at the bar having a drink <laughs> and uh, one of Jeff's people came over and said, Jeff would love to say hi and meet you guys before the dinner started. So we're like, oh, great. So we go in there and we meet the, him. We have a photo with him and he's all talking about, yeah, well, you know, you know, we'll throw a big party if this works out. And, you know, I love the show. You guys are great. Uh, and so that, I mean, that was all really exciting. We're like, oh, does he know something? Is it, <laughs> I mean, it would be so incredible if he announced it now, but you know, we're at the dinner and we haven't heard anything. So it's very unlikely. There's, there's no way really. Um, so we are sitting down having a lovely dinner and we're actually at the table, kitty corner, like right diagonal from, um, Jeff's table where, you know, Buzz Aldrin also was, and it was very cool. And, um, he was on his phone. Jeff was on his phone quite a bit. And later one of my friends who works at Blue Origin was like, he's never usually on his phone when this sort of a situation, like at a dinner or something, he's very attentive and he's not usually on his phone like that, which, you know, found out later, but basically it was him on the phone with or texting, um, with Jennifer and, and people trying to get the deal closed. Like, can I announce it now? Can I announce it now? Hmm. And, uh, so then when he went up for his, um, speech and, and discussion, he started it off by saying, uh, I, Many of you here might be, you know, know there's a little show called The Expanse. And we're like, oh, my God, he's talking about <laughs> us on stage. He's talking about us. And so we got applause and it was like, that was really cool. And then he continues on saying, and so I just got the news that The Expanse is saved. It will now be an Amazon Amazon Prime original. And we're just like, oh, I <laughs> I wish Narena, I was sitting next to Narena. We were both shocked. I'm like... Again, I think how many times have I said this whole podcast that I got teary eyed um, and the cast are jumping up and down. Even Noreen's wife, who was there, is jumping up and down. But both Noreen and I are just like sitting like stunned. Um, it it was yeah just incredible. And then later on, we're like, can you believe all that our life changed in that way? And like for the whole show and for everything at the Sheraton Airport Sheraton. <laughs> Because <laughs> it was held at like the airport hotel, you know. Um, <laughs> so it was, I still get goosebumps and chills when I think about it. Well, yeah, and that moment is on video. You know, mm -hmm. uh, people, you can go on online and watch it, and you can just see mm -hmm. on the faces of of the cast and crew and everything just how ecstatic everyone is. And like, I really just, you could really feel like that people did not want to let the show go. Like, Cass Anvar was just like all yes. over the internet. Um, there's a thing I heard where somebody asked, uh, Wes Chatham around that time, if you could play any character in any show, what would it be? And he says, I would want to play Amos Burton in season four of the expanse. You know, it was like, <laughs> yeah, he's actually said he was a fan of, uh, the books, uh, and Amos in particular before he, ha we actually even brought him in for casting. So it's always kind of funny when that happens, um, too. the same with Kara G who plays drummer. Um, but Kaz was really instrumental in getting the whole ball, ball rolling again, I think. And, and, or like I was saying before, the many different groups of fans who, who are out there doing what they can to, you know, start the campaigns going. He was really instrumental, I know, in, in bringing those kind of groups together to start working together. So he was, um, a great, great advocate for, for the show and, in, in social media and yes, refuse to let it go. Like most of us. <laughs> um, and actually at the, uh, space convention where, when we got picked up, we had, I think four of the fans who were, um, who were like kind of the leads of, um, the organization of things, um, did a lot of the, uh, fan videos and put together the banner and the, you know, this, the Rossi in space actually came, um, to the, this convention and were there during that, that, uh, that event as well and brought a banner that said, save the expanse or dear Jeff, save the expanse. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we now have that, uh, in our production office, the, the banner that they held up in the back of the, the room there, uh, at the dinner. Yeah. Well, and I think it's worth noting that I've heard that Jeff Bezos, when he would demonstrate the Kindle, that he would use mm -hmm. the text from the Expanse novels as sort yeah. of the demo text. Yeah, you so. can actually see photos of him when he'd be up there showing the Kindle and on it, it would have Leviathan Wakes, James S.A. Corey. So it's very cool. <laughs> yeah. 
And you mentioned that you, I guess you know somebody at Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos's uh, sort of space exploration company, private company. But um, you know that there, there, there's there's such a a synergy between the expanse and and Blue Origin, and the, the two can sort of um, reinforce each other and get people interested in space exploration and, and vice versa. That, it, very true, and that's one of the things since I've been working on this show um, that has become more and more important to me is is it hopefully, you know, creating that excitement of what a possible future of colonizing space could be. And, um, you know, I've, I've, like I said, I've met so many amazing, smart, science minded people, people that are creating the actual rockets that we're only emulating, uh, or, you know, extrapolating on what we have now. Um, I've, Got to be uh, one of the ambassadors for Yuri's Night this last April, which is a you know global event uh, party celebrating uh, everything space from you know not only the STEM side of things but the art as well. So it's like STEAM. Um, so we have, I think they'll have Star Trek people, and they had me from the Expanse and stuff there at the big party alongside um, NASA scientists and. Uh, uh, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, and have had great opportunities to go and visit um, the. You know, we we took a field trip to Virgin Galactic, and we've been to JPL, and our next, of course, is Blue Origin. We have a standing inv- invitation up there, but that's in Seattle, so we'll have to have a little a little uh, retreat up there <laughs> to hmm. go see Blue Origin. Um, it's opened a lot of doors. Yeah, well, and, and so um, during the Save the Expanse campaign, um, you tweeted out a couple of photos, and I'm just kind of curious what was going on in these photos. But so there's one of Cass and Far sort of like dipping you, sort of like if, when you're dancing <laughs> with someone and you kind of dip them. And then there's one of you and Wes yeah. Adam like sitting on the toilet um, in the Rosinante. I was just curious, yeah. like, what what was the like scene or what was going on behind the camera in those. Those are just fun photos, you know. We spend a lot of time on set together because I usually go up and we'll. Uh, onset produce my episode or block since we shoot in blocks so you know just late nights be on set being silly we all we all really are like a family now and um Cass has become a very good friend and we were just have you know our onset photographers just taking some pictures of us and he just suddenly like dipped me and it was just like this funny spur of the moment sort of thing um he is a you know silly funny bone um and Wes you know it was just you know see a lot of actual bathrooms on a television spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we actually have one on the Rosinante. We It's actually built. So it's just us being silly again. Um, yeah, in photos. So it's just behind the scenes, in between takes. Yeah, because cause I, I, I don't remember that toilet ever showing up on the actual show. But has so it? So it's, yeah, last season, because uh, we built it for the uh, third season. Um, Miller kind of shows up in that mirror in the window. Oh, and Holden's okay. in there. So it's like in Holden's cabin. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and so then I was also curious, now that you're on, the show is on Amazon, um, is there anything different about working with Amazon versus sci-fi, like in, just in terms of like any of the um, practical aspects of doing the show? Um, not really so far. Um, you know, there's always the beginning working with new partners and feeling each other out, but they're, they've been an incredible, uh, support and, um, they're already gearing up for, you know, bigger marketing than, you know, we've ever had before, which has been really awesome working with their social media and marketing team there, by the way, they are working on getting the, um, expand sci-fi Twitter to over to Amazon. They're working on all that. Um, as far as the creative side of things, um, you know, we, we had to jump back in really quickly. So we're all really under the gun and moving as fast as we can, but they've been, um, incredibly supportive and, and, uh, it's been great so far working with them. There was, I know there was a lot of discussion when it was announced the show was being canceled about the sets being broken down and then they got sort of a stay of execution once or twice. Did, did, mm-hmm. did the sets end up, are you using the same sets or are they like rebuilding or building new sets? Uh, well, we, we do still have, um, other than a couple of the sets that we didn't really have use for anymore, those were the first ones that ended up getting crushed uh you know i think i think they those ones were chosen first because of the hope that maybe we wouldn't have to do our hero like 
break down our hero sets. Um, and you know, then, then they were breaking down was being put on hold because of the, the talks and stuff. Um, but that's like actually trashing them. We, the sets do get broken down typically in between seasons. They all go into these big trailers that go under this, uh, you know, empty, um, construction site sort of place and until we, you know, start production again and they get all put back together. Man, I don't know. That's a, a lot of work documenting every little thing from every set that goes into these big trailers. But, um, yeah, we will be, we're building some new sets for this new season. We've got, um, a very exciting, some very exciting new places that we've never seen before. So it's, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, so talk about one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because there's this new graphic novel, The Expanse Origins. Could you talk about how that came about? Um, yes. So Georgia Lee, who was another, uh, well, she is now on the 100, but she was with us for three seasons. She was unfortunately one of the losses we had during our cancellation. Um, we were asked to do the five issue um, Expanse Origins that came about like two years ago. I think we started it. Um, and it was just set for the five, uh, five issues. Um, and George and I had never written, uh, graphic novels before, but we're up to the task and excited to learn something new and, and dive into it. And Ty and Daniel had asked us themselves because they have the, you know, kind of control over those rights and whatnot. Um, and so we felt very honored to be asked to do that. Uh, and so it was a crash course in, um, the dynamics of writing one. And I really, it's a lot more work than I had ever realized. I have a whole new respect for, for graphic novelists and, and uh, comic artists. And um, not that I didn't already enjoy them, but just now understanding the amount of work that goes into them uh, is incredible. Um, and f- being able to kind of be the director, I never really realized I had much of a interest in actually directing, but writing the graphic novels has kind of brought that, that piqued that interest, we'll say, um, because when you're writing them, you're describing the entire scene and, you know, the angle of the shot and what you want, which is a lot like directing. And so, um, that was a really unique, uh, cool experience to have. And, you know, also learning what exactly you do differently next time versus, <laughs> you know, what you do the same. Um, and so then George and I, as a beginner, we wrote the first one together and then we went back and forth. So she wrote two and then I wrote three and then she wrote four and I wrote five. And so when you say that it was sort of a crash course, were you just sort of learning by trial and error or were you reading books or reading consulting books? anyone? Um, reading, I mean, uh, Daniel Abraham had written some before. He kind of knew a bit about um, graphic novel writing and then... Also, I read a lot of Neil Gaiman, and he actually has some of his, like, Sandman series where it's annotated, and he, you can see the pages that he wrote and how they were translated into the visuals. So those were extremely helpful. Um, and as someone who loves Neil Gaiman's work, anyway, it was, it was a fun experience at the same time. <laughs> So is there, if you had to give advice to someone who's doing a graphic novel for the first time, is there anything that you could say based on your experience that, that you would, what advice you would give? Read a lot of them. Um, and find the ones that have the author's script pages, maybe as an edition, you know, maybe they're a special edition. I think the more you read them, the better idea you'll get of how they're written. If you read the script pages side by side, um, and just doing it, I think it's the same thing with screenwriting as well. Um, read a lot, read a lot of scripts, um, take note on what you liked, what you didn't, that sort of thing. Um, kind of learn trial by error as well. And so the this uh, this graphic novel um, it tells the backstories of some of the major characters. So you've got James Holton, Naomi Nagata, Alex Kamal, Amos Burton, and Josephus Miller. Mm-hmm. Um, did you like, how did that list of, uh, characters, how did, how did, how did you collectively come up with that list of characters to, to cover on the, in the comic? Um, that was the original concept, although the fifth one originally was the concept of just, um, some other random character or like the Canterbury ship or something that was along those lines. But, um, George and I really felt strongly like as the fifth, like, even though by the time they'd come out, Miller had passed. Um, I was like, 
people want to know those sort of backstories. Like they love this character so much. It would be, I think a really sad waste to not do um, a story on him um, rather than a character that we don't really know as well. Um, or is not a main mainstay in the story. Um, and so that's how the Miller one came about, but the rest of them, the Rossi crew was in the initial um, pitch from when Ty and Daniel got George and me on board. Now did Ty and Daniel, did they know the incidents related in these comics from the start or did you sort of work those out? So we developed stories, uh, George and me, um, and then we would pitch them to Daniel. Ty was a little bit involved. I think he had a lot of other stuff that was going on. He obviously read it, but Daniel was the one that was more hands-on with us and giving notes and making sure that it was staying in the canon that he wanted as a uh, creator and uh, that it wouldn't do any damage going way forward because I've only read five of the books so far. I haven't read them all either. Um, and But it was really easy working. Like I, It was a an easy and good working experience. And it's actually is kind of fun because there are a few things that have made it into now the canon of the show that was created in the graphic novel specifically in Alex's, um, Alex's story. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so the, the artist is, uh, is named Tuang Don Lan. Um, mm -hmm. what was it like? Did you work with him or did you like just email stuff to him or? We actually just worked with our editor at Boom. Um, I, we never actually were able to talk to them or email with them. Uh, we'd give notes, uh, write down notes, uh, and then give them to the editor who would then try, like give them to, um, or translate them. But I think that is one of the things that I learned um, that I would probably do differently uh, is the relationship between the artist and the writer, because they are really, you're wanting to translate your vision and um, we didn't really get to do that. So yeah, I'd want, if I did a, a graphic novel again, I, I really want to have a, a relationship with the artist and be able to collaborate a bit more than we were able to. I mean, do you think that you will do any more graphic novels? Um, I don't have any current ideas of my own. Uh, it, would, it would depend on if I was approached and like the subject and like I said, was actually able to work uh, with the artist as well. Yeah. You mentioned that Georgia Lee uh, moved on to the 100. Have you hired new people to replace the ones who like left during the transition? <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we also lost Robin Vice um, to another show. It was unfortunate, um, but they're always they'll all be part of the the Expanse family always. And I talk to Georgia all the time and to Robin. But we did hire um, two new women writers, Laura Marks and Denise Harkavy, and um, they've been a wonderful addition and a new kind of perspective and voice, uh, which has been neat and denise is a huge fan of the show when she came in and so it was, it was cool to have that perspective of somebody who hasn't been in the room but has been a fan before um which has been nice what sort of background do they have uh laura marks has done a lot of uh she's a playwright from new york um she's now her deal just ended with us and so she's now back in new york um working on um uh, uh, the good fight, the good fight. And she's done a lot of play, right? Um, I don't know any titles offhand. Uh, and then Denise Harkavy is, um, she's had a, she's a newer writer. Um, she's great spitfire, very fun, um, woman. And she's from, grew up in Germany, uh, from Iranian descent. And, uh, she has since her deal has moved, they were short deals. And so she's, she's now, you know, we're going to move on to something else as well. But, you know, we all hope that, you know, in season five, uh, <laughs> we can have them back. Um, yeah. So it's been nice having them. Is there definitely going to be a season five? Do you know how, like how much has Amazon committed to at this point? No, I have no idea. It's one of those waiting <laughs> things again. Um, we always have hope and, 
you know, I would like, I think it would just be crazy not to have a season five after everything that went on, you know? Uh, but you know, this, this business, you, uh, as you know, you can get a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes and have amazing reviews and get canceled. So it's, it's, it's a strange business. <laughs> yeah. But just think about how much fun the hashtag save the expanse again campaign would be. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what we would do next time. Um, as far as, you know, the, uh, plane or anything like that. I wonder hmm, it would be interesting. Although I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was also just curious, you know, we mentioned that you've been, I think, basically running the Expanse WR um, Twitter um, handle. Do you want, yeah. do you have any sort of just um, experiences from doing that that kind of stick out in your mind? Um, the life of its own that it's taken on. So I don't really have or didn't have that much Twitter experience. I rarely tweet from my own, my own uh, handle uh, and just started it in like middle of season one because I was like, oh, it'd be fun to do writer's room quote of the day or whatever. Uh, and has ended up just being a really fun way to communicate with fans. We do our live tweets and we started just randomly one day we decided, oh, we're going to do a Twitter fan of the week. And we would pick someone's name out of the hat of a fan that tweets a lot about the expanse and send them um, you know, some, some expanse merchandise or something that we had. Uh, and it's been a really cool way to feel connected. And I know it was a really, ha I mean, luckily happened to be a great instrument in the save the expanse campaign. And I know they've done some research on the analytics behind campaigns and social media and the expanse writers room for our campaign was, was, above and beyond, I guess, which is all news to me. I'm like, Oh, this is incredible. This is awesome. Cause I, I didn't go into it with any sort of intent on doing anything more than, than reaching out to fans. And so it was, it, it's been a cool experience. I mean, there are two things I saw on the Expanse WR Twitter feed um, mm -hmm. recently that sort of have stuck with me. And one is um, somebody telling the story of the Expanse to kids in Africa. Uh, and the yes. other is the, the girl with hair um, yeah. similar to Naomi Nagata. Could you just uh, yeah. explain those? Um, we just happened to come across the little girl that I think she was make you know, being made fun of or was uncomfortable on her haircut, which is kind of Naomi's kind of haircut. She, but it was beautiful. It was, um, and so it was just, we just tweeted out like she has hair just like our lead actress and it's gorgeous and everybody loves it and to be who you are and be strong and, um, which was, yeah, a lovely emotional tweet and the actually the the africa one uh the new save um save the or the expanse saved website that fans have just created uh actually brought that story to our attention and um was just i keep saying i'm i keep i feel like i keep saying emotionally like <laughs> crying all the time but it really it did it just touches this place where it's like wow it's so hard to see the conditions that the kids live in, live in, but at the same time, amazing to see their spirit and the excitement of the kids as well. So it's just a very touching story. Um, I'd love to see more of that. Right. So as I understood the story, there, there was someone who was working in Africa and was yes. just sort of relating this, the, the plot of The Expanse to, yes, to these kids yeah. who had never seen television, but just sort of like allowing them to experience the story just – uh, in story through storytelling yeah verbally um they they don't have any you know video or audio of it so i think they were just re retelling the story verbally and the kids imagination making making it up and i guess they were you know running around the room like they are in the rocket ship or the pilot like alex and you know it's their form of entertainment there which is inspiring yeah. Well, and you mentioned the Expanse fans. I, I, that reminds me, I wanted to mention there's a website called the Expanse Yes, and that's there the one. Are, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And there are um, very, very detailed accounts of, of the Save the Expanse campaign and mm -hmm. who was involved and how it came together. So I would really strongly recommend people check those out to get all the details and, and you know, learn all the people who were responsible and everything. Yes. That's, I second that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. And so we're pretty much out of time. Um, do you have anything else, any final thoughts or just anything else you wanted to mention? Uh, just thank you. Thank you again to all the fans. Um, I, 
don't even know how to actually articulate my gratefulness. Uh, it's been so fun meeting you guys and interacting with you guys over the seasons, and I'm looking forward to so much more to come. Uh, yeah, this has been great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, great. Yeah, so we've been speaking with Hallie Lambert about this graphic novel, The Expanse Origins. And then, of course, everyone be sure to check out season four of The Expanse on Amazon Prime next year. And so, Hallie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Hallie Lambert for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Silk Sambora, who writes, I've been listening to this podcast for a while now, both on iTunes and YouTube, and I thought I should finally give it the five-star review it deserves. With a great selection of speakers each episode, interesting topics, and superb questions when interviewing authors, this is now the only podcast I listen to. Thank you, Geek's Guide. Keep doing what you're doing. So big thanks again to Silk Sambora for that great review. Special thanks as well to Jonathan Pagel, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.